Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Rare Bleeding Disorder Manifestations in Women and Girls. My name is Dr. Carrie Funkhauser, and I am the Director of Education for the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders. The Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders mission is to ensure that all women and girls with blood disorders are correctly diagnosed and optimally treated and managed at every life stage. To this end, we aim to provide education to healthcare providers on the medical consequences and unique issues for women and girls with blood disorders. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few reminders and helpful hints. To ensure the best sound quality during the webinar, all attendees will be muted. However, all attendees will have the opportunity to participate in a question and answer session with the instructors at the end of the webinar. You can submit your questions during or after the webinar via the chat box in your GoToWebinar panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We will address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. We gladly welcome your input. I would like to now introduce our incredible moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Amy Shapiro. Dr. Shapiro is the medical director and co-founder of the Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. She is a leading pediatric hematologist and was most recently recognized as a pioneer in her field by the American Journal of Hematology. Dr. Shapiro also established the National Hemophilia Foundation endorsed the Partners in Bleeding Disorders Education Program, which serves to promote excellence in care through basic and advanced education for nurses and other providers who serve patients with bleeding disorders. Therefore, it is with great pleasure that I turn the screen over to Dr. Shapiro, who will introduce our two speakers for today, as well as manage the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Dr. Shapiro? Thank you, Carrie. Um, welcome again, and thank you for joining us for a presentation on rare bleeding disorder manifestations in women and girls. I'm Dr. Shapiro, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I'm very happy to introduce our speakers today. They include Dr. Shveta Gupta and Dr. Suchitra Acharya. Dr. Gupta is a pediatric hematologist at the Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center in Indianapolis. Dr. Gupta completed her pediatric residency at OSF St. Francis Medical Center in Peoria, Illinois, and her pediatric hematology and oncology fellowship at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Dr. Gupta has a special interest in von Willebrand disease, carriers of hemophilia, and rare bleeding disorders, and has authored a number of papers in this area in journals including Hemophilia, Pediatric Hematology Oncology, and the American Journal of Hematology. Dr. Gupta has a clean in, keen interest in research and is the IHTC Principal Investigator for several multi-center international research studies on von Willebrand disease and PI1 deficiency. Dr. Acharya is a pediatric hematologist at the Cohen Children's Medical Center of New York and the Zucker School of Medicine, Hofstra Northwell. Dr. Acharya completed her pediatric residency at Westchester County Medical Center and New York Medical College, and her pediatric hematology oncology and stem cell transplantation fellowship at Weill Cornell Medical Center and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Acharya established the first North American Rare Bleeding Disorder Registry, which has helped us to understand the association between factor levels and bleeding phenotype, and highlighted the disorders with no association, such as factor 11 deficiency. She also has a keen interest in thrombosis, especially in children and young adults. The first segment of this webinar is presented by Dr. Gupta and reviews type 2M von Willebrand disease, an uncommon VWD variant, and PI1 deficiency, a very rare bleeding disorder. Both of these disorders may be difficult to diagnose. This topic presents quite an interesting and thorough overview. The second segment of this webinar is presented by Dr. Acharya and reviews a variety of congenital syndromes that may be associated 
with an increased bleeding tendency. Dr. Acharya will take us through a number of syndromes from Downs to hermansky pudlock and will also cover platelet disorders both inherited and acquired, their diagnosis and potential therapeutic modalities. Both segments provide a specific focus on the impact of clinical bleeding manifestations in girls and women. Next slide, please. The following are our learning objectives for today's webinars. They include recognize common clinical syndromes that can cause bleeding in girls and women, recognize the common bleeding symptoms of type 2M von Willebrand disease and PI1 deficiency in females, recognize the importance and value of obtaining a thorough bleeding history in the evaluation of these syndromes, understand the diagnostic dilemmas in identifying these rare bleeding disorders, and know and appropriate apply available therapeutics and treatments in the optimal management of bleeding complications in these rare bleeding disorders in females during the reproductive years. I would now like to turn the presentation over to my great colleague and our first speaker, Dr. Shveta Gupta. Thank you so much, Amy. A very good evening to all of you. I would like to thank the foundation and my mentor, Dr. Amy Shapiro, for this wonderful opportunity to present two rare bleeding disorders, type 2M, one Willebrand disease, and 5-1 deficiency. A special thanks to our Amish patients in Indiana for broadening our knowledge base in the understanding of these disorders. Next slide, please. I will start with type 2M, one Willebrand disease, a rare subtype of the most common bleeding disorder, and we'll cover this topic through the following discussion points. Definition of type 2M, the clinical features, and then go on to describe a 2M Amish cohort with special emphasis on women's issue of menstrual bleeding and pregnancy-related complications. I will also be discussing briefly the lab issues with the VWD panel, which can muddy the diagnosis of type 2M and lead to its misclassification. Next slide, please. According to the present literature, type 2M VWD represents 5 to 10% of all von Willebrand disease patients. Von Willebrand factor binds to platelet glycoprotein 1B via A1 domain and to collagen via A3 and A1 domain. It is a qualitative variant due to defective binding of von Willebrand factor to platelets or existence of collagen binding defects. The lab diagnosis of type 2M is based on a low risticetin cofactor, normal to low von Willebrand factor antigen with a risticetin to antigen ratio of less than 0.6, but importantly with normal multimers or a normal von Willebrand factor collagen binding to antigen ratio. Highlighting a little bit about the collagen binding assay, the discrepancy between collagen binding and von Willebrand factor antigen is a sensitive screen for von Willebrand subtypes in which large molecular weight multimers are missing, as in type 2A. Since in type 2M, von Willebrand disease, we have normal multimers, the collagen binding to antigen ratio would be normal. Use of the collagen binding is associated with a three times lower rate of diagnostic error as compared to the use of only von Willebrand risticetin cofactor in making a diagnosis of the subtypes. It has to be remembered that some patients of 2M might just have collagen binding defects, and this diagnosis can be missed if the collagen binding assay is not performed. Next slide, please. This particular slide shows the location of type 2M mutations present mainly in the A1 and the A3 domain. The probability of finding a mutation is much higher if the ratio of risticetin to antigen is less than 0.4. Certain individuals could have a low risticetin cofactor, a normal von Willebrand factor antigen with a ratio even much less than 0.4, but without any bleeding symptoms. These patients could have the D1472H polymorphism in the risticetin binding site, which could result in a factitious diagnosis of type 2M. It is seen in 63% of African-Americans and 17% of Caucasians. 
due to this reason, von willebrand bristocetin is now being replaced by the glycoprotein 1BM assay. Next slide, please. Similar to any other bleeding disorder, type 2M von Willebrand disease manifests as mucocutaneous bleeding symptoms, which include epistaxis, bruising, heavy menstrual bleeding, postpartum bleeding, and post-surgical bleeding. However, irrespective of Ristocetin cofactor, antigen, and factor VIII levels, there is an extreme variability in the bleeding phenotype in type 2M. And to highlight this point, for the next couple of slides, I'll be presenting data from the IHTC 2M Amish cohort who have extended family in Wisconsin. All these patients have a missense mutation, the R1374C in exon 28. A cross-sectional study was conducted in the Amish in Indiana and Wisconsin using the Center for Disease Control Bleeding Questionnaire and the MCMDM, or the Tassetto Bleeding Score. About 780 subjects were enrolled and 17%, that is 133, were affected. The table in this particular slide shows only the Wisconsin cohort who underwent the standardized Tosetto bleeding score. And as you can see very well in this slide, the von Willebrand risk to Seton level among the affected people, that is column one, had a very low risk to Seton of only 13. The von Willebrand antigen was also low at 23, with the risk to Seton to antigen ratio going along with the 2M definition that is less than 0.6, and the factor rate was low at 49. Now, despite such low coagulation factor levels, the median bleeding score was only one. A sub-analysis of this cohort, looking at the females, showed that the sample size for the females was very less. It was only five. However, the median to set of bleeding score was seven, with the 25th percentile at 1 and 75th percentile at 7.5. Next slide, please. The Indiana population underwent the CDC bleeding questionnaire, which unfortunately did not capture reproductive tract bleeding. This graph again shows the Wisconsin cohort where menstrual bleeding and postpartum hemorrhage were queried for through the Tosetto bleeding score. Most impressive bleeding symptoms were epistaxis, easy bruising, and gingival oozing. Of note, gingival oozing is common among Amish due to poor dental hygiene and cannot be solely contributed, or rather attributed, to von Willebrand disease. If you look at the females again, there were only two out of the five women, that is 40%, who reported postpartum hemorrhage. Interestingly, heavy menstrual bleeding was not reported at all. And I will elaborate upon that in the next few slides. Of note, the sample size was very small, making it difficult to make any conclusions. Next slide, please. Heavy menstrual bleeding. So 17% of women with heavy menstrual bleeding have a hemostatic abnormality. One Willebrand disease prevalence in women with heavy menstrual bleeding is about 13%. Prevalence of heavy menstrual bleeding, on the other hand, in women with von Willebrand disease is quite high, about 70 to 90 percent. In a Canadian cohort of type 2M von Willebrand disease patients, 70 percent of the affected women reported heavy menstrual bleeding. In comparison to this, it is extremely difficult to find the prevalence of heavy menstrual bleeding in our Amish cohort because the report of this symptom is very low. We know that heavy menstrual bleeding exists from the point of care hemoglobin checks that we have been doing at outreach clinics. Now, this low symptom reporting could be because of issues related to what these women consider as normal or because of their stoic nature. The bleeding score may be skewed because it gives a score of one and above only if the patient seeks medical care or is using oral contraceptive pills which is hardly ever existing in the Amish. We have now modified the Tosetta score such that the Amish women achieve a score of one even if they use home remedies for heavy menstrual bleeding. Although these women are extremely reluctant to using oral contraceptive pills, they do use antifibrinolytic agents like amino caproic acid and tronixamic acid on persuasion. Next slide, please. Moving on to von Willebrand disease and its effect on pregnancy. 
In a study done by Dr. Andrew James using the nationwide inpatient samples, more than 4,000 deliveries among women with von Willebrand disease were compared to women without von Willebrand disease. It was found that the odds ratio of antepartum bleeding was 10.2 as compared to normal women, postpartum hemorrhage was higher with an odds ratio of 1.5, perineal hematoma of 3, transfusion requirement was significantly higher at an odds ratio of 4.7 as compared to women without von Willebrand disease. Maternal mortality was significantly higher, 10 times higher in von Willebrand disease women as compared to the normal. However, reassuringly, there was no evidence that women with von Willebrand disease had higher rates of fertility issues, increased risk of miscarriage, preterm labor, placental abruption, fetal growth restriction, or intrauterine fetal demise. Next slide, please. As you can see from this figure, primary postpartum hemorrhage is seen in 16 to 29% of all deliveries in women with von Willebrand disease. In the second part of the figure, the highlighted portion shows that type 2M patients have about 50 to 54% of their deliveries resulting in postpartum hemorrhage, much higher as compared to type 1, where it is only 10 to 37%. Next slide, please. Von Willebrand factor levels increase in pregnancy beginning during the second trimester with the peak level at term, followed by return to baseline very quickly in the postpartum period. However, in type 2 patients, von Willebrand factor activity might not increase significantly, and even if it does, it is dysfunctional protein. The risk of hemorrhage increases in patients with type 2 von Willebrand disease if no prophylactic treatment is given or if the level is less than 50% for von Willebrand factor risto. The risk of postpartum hemorrhage remains high for three to five weeks postpartum in von Willebrand disease patients. Dr. Andrew James looked at von Willebrand and factor rate levels in the postpartum period, again in women with and without von Willebrand disease. 40 women without von Willebrand disease and 32 with von Willebrand disease were enrolled in the study. The majority of type 1 patients were not treated. All type 2 patients were treated. Von Willebrand factor levels were measured at 36 weeks on admission and at several time points in the postpartum period till 6 weeks. Blood loss at the time of delivery and postpartum was measured using a PBAC score as shown in the figure. As we can see from this, the women who were treated with the purple arrows had the most significant amount of blood loss, even up to four weeks postpartum. More than 50% of these women had type 2 von Willebrand disease and had the lowest levels of von Willebrand factor despite being treated. Next slide, please. Again, you can see here the purple arrows point to the treated von Willebrand disease group and this cohort had lowest values of risticetin, antigen, and factor VIII despite treatment throughout the postpartum period. Risticetin fell to less than 50% by day seven, as shown in figure A. Von Willebrand factor and factor VIII also fell to 50% by day 14, as shown in figure B and C by the purple arrows. So although von Willebrand factor levels increase in third trimester, peak at about 12 hours postpartum, they start approaching baseline by one week and are at baseline by three weeks due to which our patients are highly susceptible to postpartum hemorrhage. Next slide, please. In this study done by Dr. Andrew James, only one patient bled who had type 2B von Willebrand disease. Looking at the highlighted areas, there were two patients with type 2M von Willebrand disease. Patient number 11 was a patient from the IHTC Amish cohort. Interestingly, this patient had a very low risticetin of less than 10 with an antigen of 15 and a factor rate of 27. This patient received only one dose of von Willebrand factor concentrate prior to delivery at 100% correction and did not get any further doses, and yet she did not bleed. Subsequently, after the study, she has had two more pregnancies 
including twin delivery with no additional factor concentrate except at delivery. Next slide, please. In the interest of time, I have not presented our unpublished data on Amish 2M pregnancies, but we have had multiple deliveries, vaginal and C-section, with variable postpartum bleeding despite similar levels, similar mutation, and treatment. Based on our experience, we have developed a tiered risk stratification with replacement therapy protocol. Women are stratified into three tiers based on personal or family history of bleeding with childbirth. Next slide, please. Tier one is the lowest risk tier where von Willebrand factor replacement dose is only given with excessive bleeding or a postpartum hematocrit of less than 30. Tier two is intermediate risk where a single prophylactic von Willebrand factor replacement dose is given immediately prior to delivery and then the patient is monitored with serial hematocrits being replaced only as needed. Tier three is the high risk, which also includes C-sections. In this category, prophylactic von Willebrand factor dose is given immediately prior to delivery, 12 hours postpartum, and then the patients are monitored with serial hematocrits being replaced as needed. IHTC outreach nurse provides peripartum monitoring using a hematocrit machine. Using this strategy, we have had an 83% reduction in von Willebrand factor concentrate administration. Next slide, please. EDAVP has been successfully used in type 1 von Willebrand disease. And we all know that it does work in some patients with type 2, and specifically type 2M von Willebrand disease. However, in our IHTC cohort of 2M patients, we have noticed a poor response to intranasal and subcutaneous DDAVP. There was only one subject, as shown by purple arrows in the first figure, who had a risticetin of barely more than 40% at four hours when tested by the subcutaneous route. So we can see from these figures that despite having similar baseline levels of risticetin, factor VIII, and antigen, despite belonging to the same family and having the same mutation, there was an extremely variable response among different people with DDAVP. In a Canadian study of type 2M patients with eight different mutations in 16 families, only 15% responded to DDAVP. Of note, although we have not used DDAVP in pregnant females in our cohort due to the above data, it has been used in patients with different mutations in type 2M during pregnancy, prior to delivery, at 24 hours and 48 hours, with safety and with efficient hemostasis. However, the provider has to individualize its use due to concerns of its oxytoxic effects, placental insufficiency, maternal and neonatal hyponatremia. Next slide, please. So summarizing type 2M von Willebrand disease, it is a mild to moderate bleeding disorder with a variable bleeding phenotype. It is a difficult diagnosis due to a variable lab phenotype and can be misclassified as type 1 or type 2A von Willebrand disease. These patients may or may not respond to DDAVP and the majority require von Willebrand factor containing concentrate. Always perform von Willebrand factor collagen binding assay and genotyping should be done if feasible. Women with type 2M von Willebrand disease might either be under or overtreated based on clinical and lab data. Next slide, please. So moving over to the next rare bleeding disorder, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1 deficiency. In the next few slides, I'll be talking about the role of PI1 in hemostasis, clinical features of its deficiency state in terms of bleeding symptoms, difficulties in the diagnosis of this rare bleeding disorder. And finally, we'll discuss about menstrual bleeding, pregnancy-related complications, and their management in women with PI1 deficiency. Next slide, please. PI1 is a member of the serin protease inhibitor that is serpent superfamily. The gene for PI1 is located on chromosome 7, spans approximately 12 kilobytes, and consists of nine exons. 
It is synthesized in various cells, including endothelial cells, megakaryocytes, hepatocytes, and adipocytes. It has several roles to play in hemostasis, wound healing, angiogenesis, ovulation, embryogenesis, inflammation, tumor metastasis, and now we know in vascular senescence. Next slide, please. As can be seen in this figure, plasminogen activation is by urokinase plasminogen activator and tissue plasminogen activator. These plasminogen activators convert plasminogen to plasmin, which in turn converts fibrin to fibrin degradation products, resulting in fibrinolysis. PI1 inhibits this. TPA and UPA interact with PI1 and inhibit the process. PI1 can also bind to fibrin and inhibit plasminogen activators irreversibly and is thereby called a suicide inhibitor. Next slide, please. PI1 deficiency is an autosomal recessive bleeding disorder and the prevalence of this rare bleeding disorder is unknown. Just like any other bleeding disorder, there could be major or minor mucocutaneous bleeding symptoms and there are no unique bleeding symptoms due to PI1 deficiency. At Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center, we have identified a kindred from the old order Amish community, now followed for more than 24 years with a rare loss of function mutation in the serpent 1 gene causing complete PI1 deficiency. Next slide, please. Looking at the bleeding symptoms from the Amish cohort, it can be noted from this slide that it is a moderate severe bleeding disorder. The initial proband, patient number one, was initially described in 1992 and was nine years then. Presently, she's 35 years of age. She had sustained a subcalian hematoma after a minor injury at age three, requiring surgical evacuation, which resulted in further bleeding and needing a packed red blood cell transfusion. She also had a large palatal hemorrhage requiring hospitalization and transfusion. Several of her siblings are affected, and today we know of 11 homozygous by one affected individuals. Her brother, who's listed as number two, is now 15 years of age and had a large epidural hemorrhage at the age of four months after minor head trauma requiring hospitalization and drainage. Other bleeding symptoms in this cohort have included subperiosteal, mandibular bleed, hemarthrosis, frequent bruising, and hematomas. Next slide, please. Looking at women with gynecological bleeding symptoms, we can see that most of these patients report heavy menstrual bleeding. It was significant enough to require packed red blood cells and IV iron in patient number one, and others needed oral iron therapy. Initially, when the patients were diagnosed, they used aminocaproic acid. Only one patient, that is patient number one, was agreeable to using oral contraceptive pills. The Amish have also used a progesterone-containing cream called Progesta Care Cream, 20 milligram of progesterone per pump, and one pump is applied daily to the abdomen and thighs at the time of the menses. Presently, due to a better side effect profile, they're using tronicimic acid, one to two tablets three times a day, and the progesticare cream with good success. Two of these patients, that is patient number one and three, had hemorrhagic rupture of ovarian cysts associated with anemia, treated with antifibrinolytic agents, although one patient needed packed red blood cell transfusion twice. Next slide, please. This table summarizes the obstetrical history of two homozygous PI1 deficient patients. As you can see, antipartum bleeding is common in the first and the second trimester, which was treated with aminocaproic acid intermittently and helped in controlling the bleeding for the most part. The first patient had a miscarriage in the second pregnancy at six weeks, and she also developed a pelvic hematoma in the third pregnancy, which required evacuation. The early start of antifibrinolytic agents helped in sustaining longer pregnancies as is seen in the second patient's third and fourth pregnancy. These women received antifibrinolytic agents for two weeks postpartum. 
all of these pregnancies were associated with preterm labor and the babies were born around 31, 34 weeks, except for one who was delivered at 36 weeks. These babies did not have any developmental abnormality, but did have respiratory distress syndrome and two had hyperbilirubinemia. Next slide, please. Dr. Iwaki from Japan reports two females diagnosed later on in age at 47 and 70 years. One of them had complete PI-1 deficiency with excessively heavy menstrual periods, losing six liters of blood through her first menstrual cycle. She also had antepartum, postpartum bleeding and miscarriage, which required treatment with FFP. The second patient with dysfunctional PI-1 had uterine hemorrhage with pregnancy, resulting in preterm labor. She also had a cerebellar and subarachnoid hemorrhage and heavy menstrual bleeding. Next slide, please. The last diagnosis of PI-1 is extremely tricky. PI-1 has diurnal variation. High values are seen in the morning with the nadir and afternoon. It is best to test PI-1 first thing in the morning in a fasting state. These patients have a normal coagulation screen of PT and PTT, but the euglobin clot lysis time is shortened due to increased fibrinolytic activity. Specific PI-1 testing should include the activity. However, the PI-1 activity assays include zero within normal range, not allowing discrimination between normal and affected individuals. PI-1 activity assays also lack standardized interpretation. PI-1 antigen testing should be performed because in complete PI-1 deficiency, both antigen and activity would be undetectable, but it is not very helpful in dysproteinemic states. Summarizing, a clear diagnostic gap exists with the use of presently available PI-1 assays. It results in either over or under diagnosis, there is need for development of an improved PI-1 activity assay that is able to discriminate between affected and unaffected individuals. Genotyping should be performed and is available for the serpent gene through University of Michigan. Next slide, please. Based on our experience with the PI-1 patients, we have developed an in-house protocol for treatment of PI-1 deficient patients. In heavy menstrual bleeding, the patients are advised to start antifibrinolytic agents, tranexamic acid or aminocaproic acid, a week prior to the onset of menses and to take it at a low dose. On day one of menses, they're advised to increase to full dose, that is three to four times daily. If heavy menstrual bleeding continues, despite the above regimen, patients on their own have added progestacare cream. We at IHTC do not recommend progestacare cream to other bleeding disorder patients with heavy menstrual bleeding. However, because the Amish patients are culturally different, they seek out natural remedies and have preferred its use rather than using oral contraceptive pills. Iron supplements are routinely recommended for this population. Next slide, please. For pregnancy, the treatment protocol is that in the first and the second trimester, patients are advised to use tranexamic acid or aminocaproic acid for intermittent bleeding as needed. But from the 26th week onwards, they're advised to use prophylactic continuous antifibrinolytic agents till delivery or at least for two weeks postpartum. Teratogenicity of these agents is unknown, but from our experience, we have not seen any effects. Overall, tranexamic acid is better tolerated as compared to aminocaproic acid due to the GI side effects seen with aminocaproic acid. Next slide, please. Of very high interest to us is the fact that murine models of complete PI-1 deficiency express hemostatic abnormalities as well as development of age-dependent cardiac fibrosis. Seven of the 10 complete PI-1 deficient individuals from the IHTC cohort have shown cardiac fibrosis ranging from one to 
This was through an NIH-funded study in collaboration with Northwestern University on cardiac MRIs. Unfortunately, a 32-year-old PI-1 deficient male with 19% cardiac fibrosis and a 32% ejection fraction succumbed to certain cardiac death. Next slide, please. As you can see, this MRI shows the white areas which are consistent with cardiac fibrosis in figure B. Figure A is a normal cardiac MRI. The exact mechanism is not known, but PI-1 controls the cardiac transforming growth factor beta axis and its early transcriptional effects that lead to myocardial fibrosis. These data emphasize the need to screen with echocardiograms annually, beginning at 15 years in complete PI-1 deficient patients to assess ventricular function and perform cardiac MRIs as needed to quantify person fibrosis and progression. Next slide, please. So summarizing, in PI-1 deficiency, bleeding symptoms are similar to any other bleeding disorder. Heavy menstrual bleeding, pregnancy complications are common. Current lab testing is inadequate to diagnose dysproteinemic PI-1 deficient states. Genotyping can be useful. Treatment is with antifibrinolytics. Cardiac fibrosis is emerged as a significant consequence and monitoring is strongly recommended in such patients. Thank you so much. With this, I would like to hand over the presentation to Dr. Acharya for the second part. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, in order to attend this webinar. I would also like to thank the organizers, uh, the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders for this opportunity, and our wonderful moderator, Dr. Amy Shapiro. Next slide, please. My part of the talk will focus on describing some congenital syndromes, both chromosomal and non-chromosomal, which may be associated with bleeding in girls and women. And these need to be recognized because a lot of these syndromes require corrective procedures. Um, the word syndrome is derived from the Greek word dramein, which means to run, and the prefix sun, which means together. And this is basically a constellation of findings in an individual with a syndrome. Since the common theme for these syndromes seems to be platelets, I would like to focus on describing uh, acquired and inherited platelet disorders. And finally, uh, I would like to focus on uh, describing connective tissue disorders where all uh, the workup for hemostatic abnormalities is completely normal. Next slide, please. Uh, chromosomal syndromes include trisomy 21, 13, 18. Turner syndrome, DeGeorge syndrome, Noonan's, and Jacobson's. These are some of the syndromes that have been defined to be associated with specific bleeding diatheses. The red boxes basically describe uh, these syndromes which are associated with severe bleeding diatheses. Next slide, please. Uh, the non-chromosomal syndromes include uh, bernard soulier Glanzmann thrombosthenia, MYH9-related disorders, gray platelet syndrome, and the Quebec platelet syndrome. Again, the boxes are describing those with severe bleeding symptoms. Next slide, please. Trisomy 21, also known as uh, Down syndrome, uh, a lot of which of who we are familiar with includes typical phases of Downs with epicanthal folds, macroglossia, uh, hypotonia developmental delays. It's, as you can see in the cytogenetic chart here, it's uh, an extra chromosome 21 that gives rise to these effects. Thrombocytopenia has been noted in Downs patients, which could present at birth as transient thrombocytopenia uh, with giant platelets, or as transient myeloproliferative disorders, also known as TMD. TMDs are diagnosed by uh, the presence of leukocytosis and peripheral blast-like cells and usually resolves within uh, a span of three months after birth. Uh, bleeding from thrombocytopenia can occur in Down syndrome girls, 
after the age of one, between the ages of one and four, and usually is due to acute myeloid leukemia. And after the age of four years, thrombocytopenia is usually due to acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And therefore, all girls suspected of having Down syndrome with all these classical features need to have a CBC at birth. Next slide, please. Uh, Turner syndrome occurs in a female with, whose chromosomal composition is 45XO, that is they are missing the X chromosome as seen in this cytogenetic chart. And these females present with classic features of web neck, a low hairline, uh, short stature, developmental delays, uh, along with rudimentary uh, gonads. Uh, Turner syndrome patients present with transient set, uh, thrombocytopenia at birth, which is uh, the incidence of which is around 30%. And since they have only a single X chromosome, they can also inherit hemophilia A or B, which, uh, through which they can present with mucocutaneous bleeding, as well as musculoskeletal bleeding, which is classic for hemophilic uh, bleeding. GI bleeding can be significant in turners due to associated inflammatory bowel disease or unrecognized intestinal telangiectasias. And in addition to supportive care um, uh, to treat the GI bleed, newer agents such as anti-angiogenic agents like thalidomide may play a major role in the management of these GI bleeds. Next slide, please. Noonan syndrome is more common. Uh, it is autosomal dominant in inheritance with a prevalence of one in 1,000 to 2,500. Amongst all the syndromes, the prevalence of bleeding disorders is very high in the Noonan's group uh, to the extent of 50 to uh, 90 percent. And the bleeding diathesis uh, in Noonan syndrome is associated with, with factor 11 deficiency, which is a rare bleeding disorder presenting with mucocutaneous bleeding and post-surgical bleeding. Uh, Noonan's patients can also have platelet function defects. Noonan's, like the Turner syndrome uh, patients, tend to have some very classical features, including the excessive uh, nuchal fold, along with swelling of the dorsum of the hands and feet, and some facial features like epicanthal folds. They also have short stature and uh, cardiac uh, defects. Noonan's patients also can develop myeloproliferative disorders, such as juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia, which they need to be monitored for. So at a minimum, a girl presenting or a woman presenting with bleeding with these features needs a CBC, a PTPTT, a factor 11 level, and a workup for platelet function defects. Next slide, please. Bijod syndrome um, is autosomal dominant in inheritance and is due to a micro deletion in chromosome 22 as shown here. Uh, they also have characteristic facial features, and they tend to have cardiac defects, typically tetralogy of fallo and aortic arch defects requiring corrective surgery. Uh, Noonan's patients present with macrothrombocytopenia, which occurs in about 30% of these individuals. And immune thrombocytopenia, or ITP, tends to be 200 times more common in the, the George uh, patients. And they can also have uh, platelet dysfunction, and this goes without saying that all patients with uh, Dijot syndrome need to have a CBC at birth to identify these defects before corrective cardiac surgery. Next slide, please. Uh, Jacobson syndrome is much rarer. It occurs uh, with an incidence of one in 100,000, and it's an inher inherited bone marrow failure syndrome presenting with a terminal deletion in chromosome 11. They, again, have classic facial features, uh, such as epicanthal folds, long philtrum, uh, small chin. Macrothrombocytopenia accounts for the thrombocytopenia in about 88% of uh, Jacobson's patients, and they have platelet function defects with the presence of giant alpha granules and storage pool defects. They also have delayed megakaryocyte maturation, so this is like a double whammy, both quantitative as well as qualitative, uh, platelet defects leading to significant uh, bleeding. And therefore, these patients need to be worked out for both quantitative as well as qualitative platelet defects prior to corrective uh, procedures. 
they can rarely present with intracranial hemorrhages because of aneurysms that they tend to develop as part of the syndrome. Next slide, please. Chidiakigashi syndrome um, is a non-chromosomal syndrome because of a defect in a lysosomal tracking protein. Uh, lysosomes are organelles and cells responsible for recycling proteins and other cellular waste and are related to uh, melanosomes because of which these individuals uh, develop oculocutaneous uh, albinism. They also uh, have the cytoplasmic inclusions in their neutrophils which causes them to have defective phagocytosis and susceptibility to recurrent pyogenic infections. And they affect uh, dense granules of platelets, uh, causing platelet function defects. As you can see on the slide, uh, this is a control patient um, electron microscopy for platelet structure. And in a patient with uh, Chediakigashi syndrome, there is absent or reduced number of morphologically abnormal um, platelet dense bodies, uh, and since platelet dense bodies play a major role in platelet aggregation, these patients tend to have uh, uh, bleeding symptoms. Uh, fortunately, the bleeding symptoms in Chediakigashi syndrome tends to be uh, mild mucocutaneous bleeding. Next slide, please. hermansky pudlak syndrome, which is the other syndrome associated with albinism, is also uh, is autosomal recessive in inheritance, much rarer. Uh, involves the HPS1 gene, which affects melanosomes, dense granules, and lysosomes like the Chediac Igashi. Uh, the uh, hermansky pudlak tends to be more common in individuals of Swiss and Puerto Rican descent. In fact, there are certain uh, mutations in the Puerto Rican uh, uh, hermansky pudlak population, which causes them to have severe pulmonary fibrosis and GI bleeding from granulomatous colitis. Women can also present with significant menorrhagia and uh, postpartum bleeding. Uh, coagulation tests such as the PT and PTTs are usually normal in hermansky pudlak um, They do have a blunted response to agonists with platelet aggregation, which we will discuss in a bit, and electron microscopy for platelets is diagnostic, where you see absent dense granules. The picture here actually shows you a family of three generations. There's a grandmother who's affected, two unaffected daughters, and three uh, affected grandchildren. Next slide, please. bernard sulia syndrome is autosomal recessive in inheritance um, and is due to a defect in the glycoprotein 1D receptor on the platelets, presenting with both qualitative as well as quantitative platelet defects. Uh, the platelets tend to be giant platelets and bleeding symptoms are mild, moderate. Glanzmann's, on the other hand, is a defect in the glycoprotein 2B3A uh, receptor and can actually present at birth with significant uh, mucocutaneous uh, bleeding. Platelet counts are usually normal, but it's a defect in the functioning of the platelets, and uh, Glanzmann's patients can have pretty significant uh, bleeding, menorrhagia, epistaxis, as well as postpartum bleeding. MYH9 related uh, syndromes, autosomal dominant in inheritance, present with macro thrombocytopenia with giant platelets, as well as these doli-like inclusions in the neutrophils in the cytoplasm uh, with significant uh, bleeding tendency. Gray platelet syndrome is a defect in the alpha granules of platelets and usually present with a quantitative uh, defect with re reduced platelets and is much milder in terms of bleeding symptoms. And Quebec platelet disorder, uh, autosomal dominant uh, in inheritance, uh, actually can cause pretty significant bleeding because uh, of both platelet as well as fibrinolytic abnormalities. Uh, these result in increased megakaryocyte expression of urokinase, which is a component of the fibrinolytic system. Urokinase activates plasminogen to form plasmin. Plasmin then breaks down uh, fibrin into fibrin degradation products, which is basically breakdown of the clot, leading to pretty significant and severe bleeding symptoms. Uh, uh, requiring uh, antifibrinolytics as well as platelets, and sometimes even these agents are not able to control the bleeding. Next slide, please. So since the theme is platelets, uh, I would like to focus a little bit on the structure of platelets, which will also help us better understand how we classify these uh, platelet uh, disorders. Um, 
chemostasis, as we all know, is well orchestrated and is a tightly regulated sequence uh, of events involving platelets, coagulation factors, and uh, blood vessels. Uh, hematopoietic stem cells uh, differentiate uh, under the influence of thrombopoietin into pro-megakaryocytes, which then undergo endomitosis to form megakaryocytes, which then produce platelets, two-thirds of which are in circulation, and a third uh, pooled in the spleen. Next slide, please. Uh, key platelet functions include platelet adhesion, platelet activation, and platelet aggregation. So whenever there's vascular injury, platelets are the first cells to go to the site of vascular injury and bind to the vascular subendothelium with the help of von Willebrand factor. And the receptor on platelets involved is the glycoprotein 1B receptor complex. As platelets adhere to the vascular endothelium, they also get activated, they change their shape. There's um, uh, secretion of ADP and thromboxin A2, which activates these platelets. Uh, also, thrombin that's generated as a result of activation of the clotting cascade uh, helps uh, recruit more platelets uh, to the site of vascular injury. Uh, subsequently, platelet aggregation occurs where platelets stick to each other via the glycoprotein 2B3A receptor and forms the primary platelet plug. Secondary uh, hemostatic plug is formed as a result of clotting factor activation, and this whole complex now seals the gap in the vascular endothelium and stops the bleeding. Next slide, please. So you can imagine, if you look at the structure of a platelet, it's easier to understand where all these defects can occur. So if you break it down as adhesion defects, we know that glycoprotein 1B receptor is involved in platelet adhesion, so you can have uh, Bernard Soulier syndrome and platelet type von Willebrand's disease, which are some of the common adhesion uh, defects. Aggregation defects include defects in glycoprotein 2B3A receptor, which includes the Glanzmann and Glanzmann like thrombopenia disorders. Uh, disorders in platelet granules, alpha granules, include gray platelet syndrome and Quebec platelet syndrome, and the dense granules and platelets. Uh, and defects in them can cause the hermansky pudlak and shelly akigashi syndromes. These are collectively grouped as storage pool diseases. And you can also get uh, receptor and signaling defects, as seen here, the thromboxin A2, PAR4, and P2Y12. These are less well-defined and less well-understood as compared to these other uh, platelet defects. Next slide, please. So we can classify platelet disorders as acquired, which is immune thrombocytopenia, which is a lot more common as compared to the inherited, inherited platelet disorders. Inherited platelet disorders can be further classified as disorders of intracellular components, alpha granules, dense granules, cytoskeleton, and enzymes, and disorders of surface membrane, which involve the two main surface receptors, like a protein 1B and 2B3A. Next slide, please. Uh, ITP, or immune thrombocytopenia, um, has a complex pathogenesis which involves both humoral as well as cellular immunity. It's usually caused by antibodies to platelet glycoprotein receptors, resulting in a shortened survival of platelets. Uh, they can present with mucocutaneous bleeding, uh, which involves epistaxis, easy bruising, bleeding after dental work, and heavy menstrual bleeding can occur in girls and uh, women. Uh, Rarely, they can present with uh, GI bleeding as well as hematuria and intracranial bleeding. By definition, ITP is defined as a platelet count less than 100,000 uh, and platelets with normal morphology and normal red blood cells and white blood cells. In pregnancy, uh, in a woman with a history of ITP requiring either epidural or, or prior to a C-section, it's recommended that platelets be maintained more than 80 to 100,000 in order to prevent significant uh, delivery and postpartum bleeding. Uh, now, I think we do not have consensus, and there are no standardized, standardized regimens for these women. Um, and so one study actually looked at a retrospective analysis in pregnant females with history of ITP. Uh, and it was at the phys physician discretion as to how they treated the patients. About half of these women were not treated and the rest uh, used IVIG and steroids. And there really was no difference in terms of platelet response to these two different uh, regimens. 
Uh, of note is that severe neonatal thrombocytopenia developed in about 9% along with intracranial hemorrhage. So there definitely exists a gap in the management of uh, women with ITP as to the medications of choice, and there might be a role for the thrombopoietin mimetic agent, which I will be talking about in a bit. Next slide, please. So treatment of IVIG involves the use of intravenous gamma globulin, which inhibits megakaryocyte apoptosis. Uh, Anti-D, which binds to the RH receptor and clears antibody coated cells and inhibits the clearance of opsonite platelets by the reticular endothelial system. Steroids reduce antibody production and phagocytosis of platelets. Rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 antibody, uh, depletes B cells, uh, and anti-CD20 uh, CD is abundantly expressed on the surface of B cells, and thus reduces antibody production. And recent uh, drugs such as the thrombopoietin mimicking uh, agents uh, are used for chronic ITP, which increase platelet production through interaction with uh, the thrombopoietin receptors. And finally, when there's a girl or a, or a female with a bleeding disorder um, related to ITP, which is not any of these above agents. I'm sorry, I, I think there's a glitch. Splenectomy is basically used when um, any of the above agents are not uh, basically effective in controlling uh, the bleeding. Next slide, please. So what are the clinical characteristics of individuals with inherited platelet disorders? These disorders are individually rare, but in aggregate they are more common and very few are systematically evaluated. So since they present with mucocutaneous bleeding, uh, von Willebrand's disease, which is more common, is ruled out first, and uh, you tend to have normal testing. Uh, and the bleeding phenotype is affected by the type of defect, the severity, and whether it's associated with a syndrome or not. Persistence of neonatal thrombocytopenia, family history of thrombocytopenia, mucocutaneous bleeding, which is out of proportion to platelet counts, as well as uh, platelet counts, which are unresponsive to typical treatments for ITP, should raise a red flag to investigate further for uh, inherited platelet disorders. Next slide, please. Uh, they can present with massive bruises, epistaxis, menorrhagia, uh, which is present since menarche, uh, other uh, mucous membrane type of bleeding, such as GI bleeding and hematuria. Um, in a study done by Norris et al., they observed that in a cohort of women with inherited thrombocytopenia, bleeding during childbirth uh, had an incidence of 6 to 14 percent. And fortunately, there were no deaths or hysterectomies that were reported in order to control uh, the bleeding. Uh, they observed that the predictors generally were severe bleeding prior to pregnancy, as well as a platelet count less than 50,000 at delivery. In another study by Sivas Chi et al., uh, who looked at um, pregnancy in women with inherited platelet disorders, they observed that uh, women with Glanzman thrombocytopenia had significant bleeding, um, and half of whom required red cell transfusions. And this was irrespective of any prophylactic platelet transfusions that they had received in preparation for delivery, which tells us that, again, um, in these bleeding disorders, there definitely exists a gap in order to identify the appropriate treatment regimen to pre prevent postpartum bleeding. Next slide, please. Uh, we are all familiar with the use of uh, bleeding assessment tools, which helps us better quantitate uh, these bleeding disorders. Um, uh, the ISTH bag has been validated for von Willebrand's disease, and more recently, uh, is being explored for inherited platelet disorders, and this one study uh, in the developing world uh, did show that in a large cohort of patients, both healthy as well as those with inherited platelet disorders, uh, the ISTH bat was able to distinguish between normal platelet function and those with inherited platelet disorders. In children who have not had hemostatic challenges, we use the pediatric bleeding questionnaire. I've just highlighted a couple components of this questionnaire. 
which goes from minus one to four. And as you can see for menorrhagia, you get a score of two for the use of antifibrinolytics or contraceptives, and a score of four when you, there needs to be replacement therapy or a blood uh, transfusion. Um, if you've had procedures and have not bled at at least two procedures, it gives you a score of minus one. Next slide, please. Uh, the pictorial bleeding assessment chart, again, uh, which is used to better define uh, menorrhagia and quantitate menorrhagia, is also being used now uh, in women and girls with significant menorrhagia. It was used in one of the study in teens when they had presented with uh, abnormal uterine bleeding and was found to uh, identify platelet function defects in 86% of these uh, girls and typically after platelet function uh, testing was normal, this uh, study looked at electron microscopy to identify storage pool disorders which were identified in 76%. And in the age of electronics, EPBAC and EBAC are also available. Next slide, please. So a diagnostic workup would include CBC and a good review of the peripheral smear when we're talking about uh, inherited platelet disorders. So as you can see in the left-hand panel, you have a giant platelet, which is basically the size of a red, size of a red cell, uh, 8 to 10 microns in diameter. And on the right-hand side panel, it's a patient with thrombocytopenia where you barely see any platelets. You see normal red cells and normal white cells. Obviously, you would do the bleeding screen with uh, PTPTT, mixing studies, fibrinogen, and a thrombin time. You do your von Willebrand panel. And then uh, when everything is normal and you have significant bleeding symptoms, as suggested by your ISTH bag or CBQ uh, scores, you want to uh, do platelet function tests. Uh, flow cytometry usually would identify uh, some of the receptors, that is the Glanzmann's uh, and Bernard Soulier, and electron microscopy will need to be done to identify uh, some of the storage pool uh, disorders. Once the diagnosis made with this theory of testing, um, genetic testing should be pursued in order uh, to be able to characterize the phenotype as well as for prenatal diagnosis. Next slide, please. Platelet um, function tests tend to be very sensitive, and therefore we usually ask patients to um, prepare in order to do the platelet function testing. A week prior, they need to avoid NSAIDs, uh, cough medicines, and uh, buy some vitamins, and 24 hours prior, some of these um, uh, herbs and other uh, foods that need to be avoided. Next slide, please. Sample integrity also affects platelet testing, so samples need to be drawn in syringes or evacuated tubes in sodium citrate with a ratio of blood to citrate ratio of 9 is to 1 and at room temperature, and these samples should not be uh, transported in pneumatic tube systems, but should be transported manually without agitation. Next slide, please. I would like to now show you how a light transmission agrigometry, which is the main platelet function testing uh, that is done. The first step is preparation of platelet-rich plasma. Anticoagulated blood samples uh, from patients and healthy controls are centrifuged in order to prepare platelet-rich plasma. Platelet-rich plasma is then collected in a cuvette and placed into the aggregometer. A light beam Once the cuvette is placed in the agrigometer, you add various agonists. The agonists that we commonly use are ADP, epinephrine, collagen, uh, thrombin, and ristrocetin. A light beam passes through the platelet-rich plasma, um, and as platelets aggregate, more light passes through it, uh, and which determines the percentage of aggregation. 
which means that if a light beam does not pass through a sample, there is a problem with platelet aggregation. Now see the percentage of aggregation that occurs, which comes out in the form of a graph, which we will go through in the next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is basically your resting platelets here. On the right-hand side, you add the agonist. Platelets undergo shape change. There's primary aggregation, secretion of nucleotides, and then you have secondary uh, aggregation and defects at these various levels can identify the various uh, platelet function defects. Next slide, please. So a patient in this upper panel you see has uh, no response to ADP, epinephrine, collagen, but does respond to Ristrocetin. And this is a patient with Glanzman's thrombosthenia. And as compared to Bernard Soulier, uh, platelets do respond to ADP, epi, and collagen, but do not respond to uh, ristocetin. And this helps differentiate these two underlying conditions, after which flow cytometry is done to confirm the diagnosis and, if possible, molecular uh, characterization. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. OK. Treatment strategies involve um, avoidance of NSAIDs, maintaining good dental hygiene, hormonal control of menstrual bleeding, and prevention of iron deficiency anemia, uh, topical control with prevention of epistaxis with the use of moisture therapy such as saline gel and Vaseline, uh, as well as some local polymers to uh, treat uh, epistaxis. Uh, Bleeding during dental procedures could be controlled with local hemostatic agents such as fibrin sealants, uh, collagen, and abatine. Antifibrinolytic agents play a major role in the treatment of the vast majority of these platelet disorders, which include aminocoproic acid and tranexamic acid, both of which are available in uh, IV as well as oral form. Next slide, please. Uh, in general, platelets would be the treatment for these platelet disorders, uh, especially if HLA matched and single donor platelets are available. However, the transfusion of, of uh, uh, viral agents, uh, severe allergic reactions, and the development of alloantibodies can preclude the use of platelets in an emergency. And therefore, uh, agents such as DDADP uh, have been found to effect, be effective in the, in the vast majority of these uh, inherited platelet disorders. However, Glanzman's thrombosthenia uh, usually fail to respond to DDADP. There's more recent experience with the use of recombinant factor 7A in Glanzman's uh, and tepomimetic agents in some of the NYH9 uh, disorders. Chiliakigashi patients would respond to a bone marrow transplantation. Next slide, please. Um, Menorrhagia related to platelet disorders uh, in, uh, would be managed with hemostatic treatments such as DDABC, uh, antifibrinolytics, uh, platelet trans transfusion sometimes, and recombinant 7A, as well as uh, gynecological measures such as the use of conjugated estrogens, levonorgestrel IUDs, and in women, uh, post childbearing age, endometrial ablation or hysterectomy. Rarely, women in the childbearing age with uncontrolled menorrhagia may also require endometrial ablation. Uh, or hysterectomy. Next slide, please. Uh, just a word about the levonorgestrel IUD, since a lot of parents and teenagers are averse to using it. Um, these are pretty effective in reducing blood loss for heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, there was an 80% reduction in blood loss in one study, uh, along with a rise in hemoglobin and rise in ferritin after six months. Uh, translating into significant improvement in quality of life measures. When the levonorgestrel IUD was compared to other measures to control heavy menstrual bleeding, it was found to be the most effective to the uh, rate of 70 to 95%. Next slide, please. So when all bleeding workup is normal, next slide, please. And a girl or a woman is still having significant bleeding symptoms you need to look into collagen defects, the hyperextensibility syndrome, such as Ehlers-Danlos. Uh, 
Uh, it's very important to perform the Baden score in any girl or woman who has significant bleeding symptoms. Uh, as seen here, one point is given for each of these, and the total score you, you can have is nine. Any score more than or equal to five is suggestive of a hyperextensibility. Um, and Ehlers-Danlos syndromes, there are various subtypes, and they are diagnosed based on major and minor criteria. And for bleeding symptoms, the bleeding assessment tool or PBQ score should be utilized, and surgical prophylaxis um, with antifibrinolytics and DDAVP should be provided. Uh, interestingly, DDAVP, by improving platelet adhesion, actually is effective in this uh, population of patients. Next slide, please. And some final uh, pearls to summarize. Uh, prolonged mucocutaneous bleeding could mean platelet disorders, factor deficiencies, which need to be looked into. Uh, repeat testing, even if the test is abnormal, it's better to confirm it one more time, given the difficulties we have with platelet function testing. And testing uh, other family members who may be affected with clinical bleeding symptoms also needs to be performed. There's significant variability in symptoms, even within a known specific bleeding disorder. And it sometimes is difficult to differentiate patients with platelet problems uh, from those who are normal, even if they have an identified severe platelet function defect. If you have a normal bleeding workup, including platelet function, rule out the hyperextensibility syndrome, iron deficiency anemia in an adolescent female, and uh, any woman who's had postpartum Bleeding uh, needs for the workup, pay attention to sample collection and processing, and once these uh, girls and women are identified, refer to a bleeding disorder center. Next slide, please. I think this is the last slide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Acharya, for your excellent presentations. We will now proceed with the question and answer part of our program. We have three questions in the queue, and um, the first one is for Dr. Gupta. Oh, we now have four. <laughs> Dr. Gupta, what do you feel? Um, what do you do about cardiac fibrosis and PI1 deficiency if you find it on monitoring? A difficult question. Yes, that's a, well, that's a very interesting question and extremely important too because from our experience uh, and having unfortunately lost a patient to cardiac fibrosis, uh, you know, at this point in time, what we are offering is a routine cardiac uh, evaluation through echoes and then looking at cardiac MRIs and referring them to a cardiologist if they have any symptoms or a reduction in ejection fraction. And these cardiologists have then managed them with, uh, you know, Holter monitoring, uh, looking at beta blockers, ACE inhibitors. Uh, in an ideal world, we should have an antifibrotic agent. Um, and I think, Dr. Shapiro, you can speak a little bit to that. But we are uh, in the process of talking to drug companies to hopefully have that uh, as a possibility for these patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. Um, the next questions are directed to Dr. Acharya. Um, do you think, uh, let me go, does Bernard Soulier really have platelets down to 10,000, or do you think that that is an error in counting due to the size uh, of the platelet? That's uh, a very important point. Um, whenever you see the manual, uh, the, sorry, the automated platelet count, that's very low. Obviously, it's important to review the smear because you will find giant platelets in somebody with Bernard Soulier, and when you actually do a manual count, it tends to be higher than the 10,000 that you would see on an automated uh, count. Thank you. Um, the next question is for you, Suchitra, as well. Uh, do you consider abnormal platelet function analysis diagnostic for a platelet disorder, or do you always do aggregation? Um, I think it's important to always do I'm, I'm, I don't think I understood the question. I'm, I'm wondering if it's the PFA that's used for the screening that the question is being asked for 
to be confirmed by platelet aggregation? Is that the question? Because some institutions have PFA, which can be used as a screen for uh, some of these platelet disorders. And if the PFA that's, screen that's is what I yeah, that's so what the I understand the question to be yes. Okay. So if the PFA is abnormal, I think it would still be important to perform platelet aggregation uh, studies because then you can actually hone down where exactly the defect is because PFA being abnormal just tells you it's you know basically abnormal platelet function, but which could mean it could be Glanzmann's or could be Bernard Soulier, it could be anything. Great. Um, also, uh, Dr. Acharya, uh, question is, is it recommended uh, or considered safe to use thrombopoietic agents in pregnancy at this point in time? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think the real issue currently is, yes, we use IVIG and steroids. Steroids can actually cause, you know, problems uh, to the neonate and the unborn fetus, and that's an issue. Um, and so the thrombopoietic, uh, thrombopoietic mim mimetic agents still need to be tried in these women since there is no consensus as to which would be safe. I don't think we have the data, but that's, you know, something that needs to be looked into. Okay. Um, one more question for you, Suchitra. How often is MYH9 bleeding severe? Uh, the person asking the question thought that it was somewhat uncommon. Yeah, it is. Un it, it, as a disorder, it's not that common, but when bleeding occurs in some of these MYH9-related uh, disorders, it could be pretty significant and severe. So obviously, they need to be identified with you know, giant platelets on the peripheral smear, and genetic testing is available for these MYH9 disorders. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gupta, given the information you provided regarding type 2M von Willebrand's disease, would you consider simate testing? And if so, what time points would you use to evaluate a patient's response? That's an important question because uh, we know that the response to type uh, in type 2M patients to simate could be extremely variable. And uh, the time points for testing should at least be up to four hours. Uh, it is uh, actually a better idea to extend it up to six hours because some patients might have an ill-sustained response and could bleed after that time point. So the more the number of time points, uh, the better is the information that you get uh, regarding the response of a patient to DDABP. So definitely extended time testing is uh, much recommended. Thank you. And um, Dr. Gupta, going back to PI-1 deficiency and cardiac fibrosis, um, at what point do you think you might recommend screening? Um, and what study would you use to screen the patient? Based on our experience, I can say that we should start with echocardiograms at the age of 15. And if we find that there is anything abnormal in those echoes, specifically in terms of a decrease in cardiac function, then we should do an MRI, and these should then be done either on an annual basis or every two years based on the, base, uh, on the findings that you get. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Acharya, for some syndromic associated bleeding, specific defects have not been identified. Based upon this, how do you recommend counseling families about bleeding risk when you're faced with such patients? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't think there are clear definitions or any kind of consensus on how to address uh, these syndromes, and that's the reason you know these bleeding assessment tools may be helpful in determining whether there are significant bleeding symptoms in the patient. And if there are significant bleeding symptoms, I think we generally would do a complete, you know, bleeding workup, uh, including platelet function defects, um, in order to identify what the bleeding diathesis is. 
I mean, I just showed you a fraction of bleeding problems associated with these syndromes. I'm sure there is a whole host of unidentified uh, bleeding problems that we don't know of today associated with a lot of these syndromes. Yes, fascinating. Thank you. I, I'll now turn this back over to our host, Carrie. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Uh, this concludes our question and answer period for the webinar. And as a reminder, the webinar has been recorded and in a few days, you will be able to review it for your reference, as well as share it with your colleagues by visiting our website at fwgbd.org and accessing it under the archived webinars section. Please note that you will also receive a follow-up email asking you to please complete a short survey. And um, please uh, complete this for us as it will help us to um, enhance our programs. And for those providers in attendance who may have questions on this material following today's webinar, we encourage you to visit our Ask the Experts feature on our website and submit your question online. I want to thank our faculty and our moderator, as well as our participants for your attendance and participation today. And we look forward to your return for future Foundation webinars. Thank you.